Welcome 3CI. My name is Maggie. It is so, so good to be with you this morning. We have Stephen back with us and he'll be preaching on the importance of community. I can tell you from my own life how important it is just to find community, to get stuck in, just to step out in faith and not be in your comfort zone. I can challenge you with this. Email info at 3ci.co.za and let's help you get stuck in. Come, let's worship together. Behold the Father's heart The mystery He lavishes on us As deep cries out to deep Oh, how desperately he wants us. The things of the earth stand next to him like a candle to the sun. Unfailing Father, what compares to his great love? Behold His Holy Son The Lion and the Lamb given to us The Word became a man That my soul should know its Savior Forsaken for the sake of all mankind Salvation is in His blood Jesus Messiah The righteous died for love It was in over For He is the risen one Then sings my soul Then sings my soul How great your love is How great your love is Yeah. 
Hello 3CI, it is so good to be back. Before I jump into the word uh, this week, I actually wanna just take a moment and say thank you. 
as much as it feels like it doesn't measure up to what I really want to say from myself, my family, my wife, my kids. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the way that we have been loved on and looked after these last two months is unprecedented. Literally, it's the gospel in full living color. And it has been breathtaking to be on the receiving end of the love and kindness of this family. Thank you for the way you loved on and looked after my children, the way you strengthened and encouraged my wife. I honestly don't know how people navigate these things on their own. And it has been an absolute privilege to be part of 3CR and the 3CR family at this time. So thank you. Thank you from the bottom of our hearts. One of the questions I was asked during this time uh, has to do with what I was going through over the last two months. And I, I want to draw on it because we were asked it by numerous people on numerous occasions. And that's this. What has God been saying over the last two months in this situation, what the valleys we're going through, what has God been saying, which is a pertinent question. You, know, you remember when lockdown started, all the stuffs that was going on inside and, and the wrestle we had with God and, and our hopes and dreams and grief and trauma. Well, God did very much the same on many fronts, but I want to draw out on one thing from a portion of scripture that is extremely familiar, but God has done a work in me that the best way I can describe it, he's weaponized this portion of scripture. He's given me a fresh understanding, recalibrated community, family, loving and looking after each other. And I want to I want to highlight this this week. And it comes from Hebrews chapter 10. I want to read from the Passion Translation, purely because the Passion Translation on this verse just gives us a, a fresh breath of, uh, of clarity and just rewords it in a way that will sort of give us a little bit of a sidestep so you can see what it is that God did through this verse as we set out together. So this is verse 25 of Hebrews 10 and it says the following. This is not the time to pull away and neglect meeting together. Some have formed the habit of doing. In fact, we should come together even more frequently. I, I know you've been bashed over the head probably with this verse. You know, Why haven't you come to church more often? They quote Hebrews 10, 25. And there is... Yeah, a whole sermon series behind that, which I won't go in right now, and value to it, especially under lockdown when you, you realize the, the value of community, and especially for me, the last two months. You know, when you're in a hospital and because of the coronavirus, you can't even be visited by your wife or your family, you suddenly realize the value of community. But I won't go into that this morning. I actually want to show you what comes after the comma, because this is what got under my skin. The writer to the Hebrew says, in fact, we should come together even more frequently. Why? in order to be eager to encourage and urge each other on. And when I read that at first, it caught my attention because we can't come together, but I thought to myself, why encourage and urge each other on? Actually, when I look at this, it's a very fluffy, ach, oh, shame, you know, do you have a boo-boo kind of a word, this word encouragement. But it got my attention and I sort of drilled down deep enough to realize that God actually, I think at this time, wants to weaponize this verse, actually he wants to recalibrate our understanding. And so I want to show you three things that I found as we look at this verse and encouraging one another in our current context, as we hold on for lockdown being lifted and face the consequences of the epidemic uh, relationally and emotionally. And so here are those three things. Firstly, the context of this verse, it mentions there that they were neglecting to meet together. For us, we can't meet together. And during lockdown, what's been very interesting is the amount of studies going on and what happens deep down inside us during times of not being able to meet together, not being able to gather together, not being able to enjoy the value of community. And there are some very dark studies that have been done on depression and trauma and grief that I won't go into today. But there was one thing that uh, the University of UCLA actually drew out that I want to mention. And it says this, eight to, we need eight to 10 positive interactions every day to stay healthy physically and emotionally. If we put that in a biblical context, we need eight to 10 gospel kingdom moments in our lives with God's people in order for us to stay healthy physically and emotionally. Eight to 10 a day. And I think for the most of us, we probably haven't had one for months, that, that deep connection with community, with a family of believers. For us, uh, last week Sunday to gather, actually two weeks ago to gather on the property, just to see one another face to face, you suddenly realize what's been missing here. And for the larger community, maybe for yourself or your family, other churches across the city, uh, the people of South Africa, we are now in this position where we are disconnected and discouraged. And this is the current climate emotionally in our country and those we are meeting 
on a day-to-day -day basis. So that's the first thing that's important about this verse. The second thing, and this is from a clinical psychologist, I love his phrasing, his name is David Murray, and he says the following of our current situation. He says, praising others, and for our purposes, encouraging others does not come easily to human nature. We like to receive praise, but not to give it. Criticizing comes much easier because we feel more comfortable looking down on people. Praise or encouragement involves looking up in admiration. It has these words. And our necks and egos tend to creak and ache when we attempt it. Affirmation or encouragement or comfort is also discouraged by powerful societal trends. Hello, 2020. Cynicism, distrust, suspicion, negativity, envy, political strife, and bad news at home and abroad all combined, look at this, to chill our hearts and shrink our souls. What an indictment against us, as Proverbs 18:21 would say. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. And so we've got this desperate need for community, for connection, but we don't have it, so we're discouraged and disconnected. We're not naturally, by nature, our fallen human nature, we're not naturally inclined to encourage, to climb into other people's values and, and encourage as we so desperately need. And that is why this verse is so important. But the third thing that's also hugely important is to understand what it is the writer to the Hebrews was actually calling them to do when he used the word encouragement. And I want to spend some time on this and drill down on this word that we have as encourage or give hope or comfort. But the Bible in the original Greek has the word parakaleo. Now, just on a surface level, parakaleo means this, to call out what God has placed within us. So it's a whole lot more than just a little pat on the back and a shame, are you okay? It's to call out what God has placed within us. But the writer to the Hebrews actually went and copied and pasted this word straight out of his Middle Eastern context. And they would use this word parakaleo essentially to describe a leader on the battlefield, a commander of armies who would urge his soldiers on in the face of insurmountable uh, attacks and you know, being surrounded by the enemy. He would come and get behind them and just lay the charge and urge them on. Or as uh, Rory often quotes that the comment made of Winston Churchill who mastered the English language and sent it out to war. This is what it means to parakaleo, to remind, to stir up, to give someone courage, to encouragement. And one of the Bible scholars actually unpacks parakaleo, taking all these bits and pieces, joining the dots like this. He says, parakaleo means to come alongside those who have lost courage, wrap them in, there, in it, fill them with it, so that they can stand firm in the midst of the challenges they are facing in their day-to-day -day life. And this is what the writer of the Hebrews charges us to do, to come alongside those who have lost courage at this time, wrap them in it, fill them with it, so that they can stand firm in the midst of the challenges they are facing in their day-to-day -day lives. And how desperate we need this in the midst of lockdown, in the midst of the, this epidemic and the crisis of 2020. My life group gathered together and they bought me a number of audiobooks and uh, one, one that I can actually highly recommend. Uh, it was so, so lucky to be able to, when, when you can't even hold a book open, to be able to actually plow through some material. And there's a book by Mark Chansky called Encouragement, Adrenaline for the Soul. I can highly recommend it. Encouragement, Adrenaline for the Soul. The basic premise here, spoiler alert, that he says what adrenaline does for the body, encouragement does for the soul. Now, you know all those stories about the crazy feats when, when people are stuck in a situation and they're able to lift weights or run at speeds or jump over walls or get away from uh, lions, whatever the case might be, when adrenaline kicks in. I did some research myself and I found one on the CNN website of a young lady, 22-year-old, petite little lady, whose dad was a mechanic and he went... Uh, 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 to work, uh, sort of had a set up in his garage. So he was in there and she was bringing him some coffee or a Coke or something like that. For whatever reason, she went to the garage and found that one of the jacks of the car had given way and this car literally had caved in on her dad. He was unconscious, lying under the full weight of this car. And she, a 22, tiny petite little lady, deadlifts this car off her dad and then still is able to drag him out from underneath this car and take him off to the emergency room at the hospital. 22 years old, and they guesstimate that she probably deadlifted about 700 to 800 kgs. 
The world record, in case you don't know, is 501 kilograms. Here's this 22-year-old dead lifting this car to get him out. And you know, this, the scientists sort of explain how your body gets these motor units together with hormones and your neural network and your blood sugar levels and all, all the science and everything like that. And they basically explain how this is possible to take something natural and make it super natural. But this is what Mark Chansky goes after in his book, Encouragement, Adrenaline for the Soul. He says, what adrenaline is able to do chemically and physiologically to the body, encouragement is able to do to our souls. Why? Because encouragement is rooted and grounded in the supernatural nature and character of God. And this is why he says that. He says, firstly, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, describing God the Father. It says, all praises belong to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for he is the Father of tender mercy and the God of endless parakaleo, the God of endless encouragement, endless comfort, endless hope. Interesting that, that uh, this translation says endless. You know, we know he's omnipresent and omnipotent and omniscient, but he's also omniparakaleo. This is the very nature and character of God the Father. It says he always comes alongside us to parakaleo us, to comfort, to encourage, to strengthen us in every suffering so that we can come alongside those who are in any painful trial. We can bring them the same comfort, the same parakaleo, the same encouragement that God has poured out upon us. So that's God the Father. It says this of Jesus in 2 Thessalonians 2. May our Lord Jesus Christ, who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and hope, encourage your hearts and strengthen you in all you do. It's this very nature and character to encourage, to parakaleo us. And then it says in John 14, 26, when Jesus is talking about the fact that he is going away and he's going to send the Holy Spirit, he describes him like this. He says, I will send you a helper. The Holy Spirit. And that word helper is parakletos, the personification of parakaleia, which basically means you've got the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all conspiring to lean into our circumstances and situations and parakaleo us, to encourage us. And that is why, if I can just take a moment, if I can move from preacher to pastor for just a minute, that is why when we choose to encourage, we step in line with the very nature and ministry of our triune God. God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit. When you choose to encourage, you are coming in line with the ministry of our Heavenly Father. You're coming in line with the very nature of Jesus. You're coming in line with the very empowering of the Holy Spirit. It's like the host of heaven gathers behind you. The resources and the life of the gospel drips from your lips as you choose to encourage. But it also means that if we, by our nature, are constantly cynical, we constantly criticize, we should recognize that as a sign of spiritual immaturity. We should recognize that as the fact that we are not taking on the nature and character of Jesus that the Holy Spirit is fashioning and forming us into, to the glory of our Father. And I know it's easy for us to say these things. It's easy for it to jump off the page. But what if I said the word to you, clicks, or Julius Malema, or ESCOM, or lockdown, or your boss? What about your wife, your husband, your teenager, the millennials you have to work with, the driver in front of you if you're busy listening on a podcast? All of a sudden, we notice that there's a difference shade to the words that come to mind, the things that we want to say. And I want to urge you, 3CR, let us be a people who walk in the footsteps of Jesus. And we are people of parakaleo, constant encouragement, coming in line with the very ministry of God. One of the stories I, I happened to listen to during lockdown, actually during these last two months, was about a pastor in World War II who was, he, he became a prisoner he was outspoken of the gospel and they didn't like the fact that he was still preaching. So they put him in prison. And what made the situation really, really dark for him was that he was engaged to get married. And he had to sit in prison knowing that his fiancée was out there facing war all on her own. The, the horrors and the tragedy and the difficulties of navigating through life in the midst of war in Germany. 
And what he was able to do, he figured a way to actually smuggle out some correspondence to her. Her name was Maria. And he, as often as he could, he would steal little scraps of paper and, and write letters of encouragement to her, specifically poems. He loved to write poetry and he would write Maria poems. And one of them, specifically around their engagement and their hopes to get married one day, was called Next Year. When he went into prison, there were signs of the fact that Germany might surrender anytime soon. And he, he sort of thought, well, you know what, if, if Germany surrenders soon, by this time next year, we could be married. And so he wrote the, these poems of encouragement to her. But through tragic situations and circumstances, he was actually executed just days before Germany surrendered. And so she was heartbroken, but deeply moved by his ministry and his, him as a human being and her fiance. And so she published those poems in a series of, of books. A few years later, in the USA, thousands of kilometers away and many years on, there was an American author named Joseph Bailey, and he went through his own unspeakable tragedies. He lost two young kids, and not long after that, he lost his oldest son, who was 18 years old and also engaged to be married, ironically. But it crushed him, as it would any father. And actually, as an author, someone involved in the creative field, he literally couldn't cope. He, he couldn't produce, which meant that he couldn't support his family financially. So you got this emotional weight, this deep grief, and then the financial pressure on top of that. And what happened was the girl who was engaged to his son actually got handed one of these books with this man's poems that he had written for Maria all those years ago, because they thought, well, you know, you're in very similar circumstances having lost your fiance as she lost hers. And this girl read Maria's uh, published book and she was so deeply moved and encouraged, she handed them over to Joseph Bailey. And he was also deeply encouraged. And, and it actually said, you, just going through these poems, he was so encouraged that his entire family was ministered to and managed to find strength and hope. And again, sort of press on through the valleys of life and find healing. So much so that when he started writing again, he included some of those poems from this book, a few stanzas, stanzas of that specific poem next year. Decades later, the story continues, the power of encouragement. Decades later, he gets this letter from a uh, hospital chaplain. It says this, it says, Dear Joseph, I'm a hospital chaplain. I have the privilege of visiting people dying of cancer. As I was making my rounds, I was introduced to a woman in the final stages of cancer, but she was in a very, very dark space. He says, I visited her several times, but just couldn't get through to her. And I just hope, so happened to have read one of your books and I was so deeply touched by your book on heaven and the hope and the encouragement I found, I decided I would pass it on to this woman. He goes on to say, I went back the next day and she told me she had stayed up all night reading this book. And at the end of it, she realized it had fundamentally resurrected her hope. It filled her with the joy and expectation what lay ahead and brought her great comfort before she died. She was Maria, 57 years old, dying of cancer. At the end of a very dark and rough life, she lost her fiance, had two very messy marriages, ended up in divorce, alienated and alone. And in that moment, those words of encouragement that had been scribbled on pieces of paper that had been smuggled out of prison decades before came full circle as a picture of what God is able to do when you and I take a hold of this, the simple act and the simple gift of parakaleia, of encouragement, allowing the gospel and the life to flow through us. Who knows what God will do with that? Who knows what lives God will touch with it? Who knows the power of the gospel poured into a broken heart through the simple act and the gift of encouragement? It might just be a phone call. I don't know if you've heard of Tony Scarcella. Jeff, before he planted into Portugal, was telling me about him. He had the privilege of hearing his testimony and he was just blown away uh, by the story. And, and during this time, I managed to track down his testimony. Tony tells the story of uh, some life choices and decisions and things that he had done that had gotten him to a place where he was absolutely gutted with guilt and shame. And he tells of how early one morning, about one, half past one in the morning, he snuck into his parents' home, uh, bedroom stole his dad's gun and decided he was going to end his life. He tells of sitting there thinking of, you know, his parents going to hear the shot, going to come to the room and what they're going to find and what they're going to feel. And he was fully convinced that when they saw him and having taken his life, he was fully convinced that they would be so relieved. He's such a mess, 
such a disappointment that they would actually be grateful that he would do that. Can you imagine the place you have to be to be at that point and think of those thoughts? And while he was busy sort of building up uh, the, this decision to pull the trigger, the phone rang and he said, purely out of habit, you know, he wasn't in a mind to answer a phone, but purely out of habit, picked up the phone and answered it. And it happened to be his youth leader. And the youth leader said the following, he said, you know what, I don't know how to describe this. Um, I was gaming at 1.30 in the morning, yeah, as, as people do, me and my best mate sitting there. And he said, I just started thinking about you. And the more I thought about you, the more I couldn't get you out of my mind. And the more I couldn't get you out of the mind, the more emotional I became to the point where I eventually had to stop gaming, step outside and just sort of regather my thoughts. He said, I didn't know what was going on. So I was walking up and down the backyard, just praying. And I felt, hey, let me phone you and encourage you. And he just said to Tony, he said, hey, Tony, I just want to let you know God sees you. He knows what you're going through. You can lean into him. He's there for you. And then he said to Tony, why don't you grab the Bible? and read Psalm 5 to me. He said, I just happened to be studying that this morning. It's fresh on my mind and I know it collates to when, when we wrestle and struggle and, and need encouragement. And Psalm 5 is all about David who's at the end of himself. And in his wrestling with his circumstances and situations, he basically finds that God hears every sigh. He hears every one of our groans. He hears and he sees and he cares. And because of his unconditional love, it doesn't matter what we've done, he, we can still enter into his presence. We can still lean on him. He still wants to wrap his arms around us and parakaleo us, encourage us and give us hope. And so the phone call ended. Tony hadn't told his youth leader what he was going through. He was still deeply embarrassed and ashamed of himself. Didn't want him to know, but he was a little bit thrown by the phone call. So he stepped out to go and gather his courage to come back again. And as he walked into the kitchen, he says, his mom had this very weird kind of stained glass window, plastic see-through cross uh, press sticked on the window. It was this little yellow tint. And as he walked in, the street lights happened to shine through and it caught his attention. And as he looked, he said, it was as if the phone call had just opened a space in his heart for him to hear God say, what I did on the cross was enough for you. And I tell you that story because Tony now, he's a pastor, he's an author, he's a speaker, he's married with kids. God has pieced that life back together. I tell you that story because I want you to see the simple act of a phone call, the simple act of encouragement can literally turn life or death to life, can literally resurrect a life. That is the power of encouragement. That is why I say when I came to these, this understanding of that very simple, very familiar verse in Hebrews 10, 25, it felt like it weaponized me because what we are facing now, so many people are discouraged, despondent, disillusioned, they're disappointed in themselves, carrying this guilt and shame or carrying the weight of 2020. So many people are doing this on their own. Don't have the privilege of a family like we have of 3CR, those in your life group, even those in your family. So many around us just need someone to wade into that battlefield. And as uh, the quote of Winston Churchill says, let us be those people who master the art of encouragement and send it out to war on their behalf. Hi guys, I'm sitting here with Mike and Ferd, both architects, they both work on staff here and they've both been instrumental in the design of the building project so far. We've been talking a little bit about some of the design changes that have uh, happened this last week and so we just wanted to update you guys and let you know what's been happening. Mike, you have been instrumental in just changing something around with uh, the entrance of the building. Why did we change it around? Um, I think it's something that we discovered on site while we're walking through. Um, as the building goes up, things change from paper to the physical yeah. building and it just it was one of those things where elements felt like the entrance needed to be in a different spot okay cool um like Freddy was saying that everything was built around flow worship and sound and so hopefully with this the flow gets better so through this change um the flow becomes more clear it's more simplified but we actually have won areas that we can use throughout the week um, for various other activities besides church on Sunday. Yeah, that's cool, man. Um, Ferd, I know in actually designing the entrance as part of the building, 
you had a specific phrase or just um, a way of thinking around it as to the reason why you designed it the way that you did. Yeah, so the heart for the entrance stays the same. Um, the heart was always that the whole family would walk through one door, which is a little bit, little bit different to what we've had in the past. So same heart, everyone walks through the same door, but there's a few more functions that we've unlocked. Awesome, thank you guys. So, so now you know a little bit more about why we've made the changes that we have this last week. Um, we get to take you along and just show you a bit more and yeah, hopefully you get a better understanding of the building that we're going to be moving into, why we're doing it the way that we are and that we all get to enjoy it together. So I hope you've had an amazing Sunday so far and have a great week ahead. We'll see you next time.